Hello and welcome to A Bit of a Christie. My name is Hazel Jones and today we have shuffled the deck and are dealing you a royal flush of an episode. We have several aces up our sleeve as we hear from the coach of the Swedish mixed bridge team, Laura Coville, and the lifelong Agatha Christie aficionado, historian and author, Ray Green. I want to thank you immensely for your ongoing support. By listening, you are part of Team A Bit of a Christie, and our podcast is truly flourishing. And it's all thanks to you and your continued engagement. If you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing on the A Bit of a Christie YouTube channel or leaving us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, it would mean the world. And your feedback really does help us to grow and improve. Now, without further ado, let's dive right back into the show. Today, we're cutting the deck and shuffling our way into the captivating world of the Agatha Christie novel, Cards on the Table. Get ready to step back in time to the publication year of 1936. While we usually kick off with a timeline of world events, today we're shaking things up and instead we're going to look at music, literature and films that shaped the cultural landscape of that year. We start with the song Pennies from Heaven by Bing Crosby. With its dreamy melody and optimistic lyrics, this tune became an anthem of hope during the midst of the Great Depression, helping listeners to look for the silver lining even in the darkest of times. Now, turning the page to the literary world, apart from Cards on the Table, of course, another book which stood out amongst the rest in 1936 was Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. This sweeping epic of love and loss set against the backdrop of the American Civil War became an instant classic, captivating readers with its vivid characters and epic storytelling. And it also gave us these classic quotes. After all, tomorrow is another day. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Finally, into the world of cinema. 1936 saw the release of one of the most iconic films of all time. Modern Times, directed by and starring Charlie Chaplin. This timeless masterpiece of comedy not only entertained audiences with Chaplin's trademark physical humour, but also offered a poignant commentary on the changing effects of industrialisation. Now, I told you we'd shuffled the cards, and we're trying something a little bit new. To help immerse you in the past, we have created a playlist on Spotify with some of the music which was popular during the day. We wanted to make sure that the songs were worldwide, so we have included songs from Japan, the USA, Brazil, Hungary, Cuba and Canada. Just search for Cards on the Playlist on Spotify. On now to the main event, Agatha Christie's cards on the table. Have you ever delved into the world of collecting? From books to cars to figurines, the objects vary. But for some, it's more than a mere hobby. In fact, it's an obsession. There is a certain allure in amassing the rarest and most exquisite pieces. But in our tale, our protagonist's collection is far from ordinary. In fact, it's sinister. Picture a collector with a penchant for the macabre, hoarding not trinkets, but something far more chilling. Murderers. Mr Shaitana invites Hercule Poirot to view his collection for himself at a dinner party. But as well as collecting murderers, he also invites a collection of detectives, with Poirot being joined by Colonel Race, Superintendent Battle, and the crime writer and favourite Ariadne Oliver. The other guest seems to represent both the potential victims and suspects. On the list are Anne Meredith, 
Dr. Roberts, Major Despar, Mrs. Lorimer and Miss Burgess. As the guests play bridge, it seems as though Mr. Shaitana has compiled the perfect collection to make a killer evening. Our next guest is Ray Green, the author of a new book, Agatha Christie's Doctors. Ray previously held the position of senior lecturer in English, history and archaeology. She is a lifelong Agatha Christie fan, with a knowledge of her works which cannot be surpassed. Her passion led her to the co-editorship of the Agatha Christie The Legacy fanzine, which saw a successful publication in March 2020 amidst the throes of the COVID-19 pandemic. The fanzine quickly sold out and back copies are highly sought after. Outside of her academic and Agatha pursuits, she established the World History Society, a testament to her commitment to preserving local history where she lives. So, without further ado, let's meet Ray. Hello and welcome, Ray, to A Bit of a Christie. To start us off, Ray, would you mind explaining how the idea for this new and exciting book, Agatha Christie's Doctors, first came about? Yes, I think I can. Um, I've, I've got two, two or three books which um, triggered off some of the ideas. One of them's at the Agatha Christie A to Z, and, and there's the new Poirot, which which uh, Mark Aldridge is, and Sova and Toy. And, and the Sova and Toy ones both have individual books at all people in alphabetical order and da 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 And then one day, and I don't know where this bit came from, I came up with the little thought, where there's a murder, there has to have been a death. And where there's a death, there has to have been a doctor. And I thought, oh, I don't think anybody's written up all the doctors. And I just started doing it. And I started with styles and was mortified to find how many medics she'd managed to get in the mysterious affair at styles. <laughs> and and she's done that more than once. I mean, another one that she that's absolutely packed with medics is is pocket full of rye. And and so and, and I just got completely gripped by it. And it I just went on and on and on with it, and there it was. You've got this idea. What steps do you take next to push the idea along? The next thing that I did was I signed on for a course with Oxford University who was doing a history of medicine course. And and although I taught history of medicine, I'd been retired for some time, and I thought, let's just get a refresher course in. So I did that, and and that was was helpful. and then I started dividing my my doctors up into categories and putting them in categories was really interesting and I enjoyed that very much. How did you decide to structure the book? How is it split up? Um, there are 15 chapters and, and different sorts of categories, some of which I'm going to miss out because I don't want to give too much away. But general practitioners... Pharmacists, nurses, Harley Street, hospital medics, um, police surgeons, suspects, sleuths, fakes, and so on. Ray, in writing this book, you looked at 184 medical professionals which are mentioned in these books. Were there any surprises? I was shocked. That, I mean, I didn't expect that I would have to include Hercule Quarren. Ah, so we will have to look out for that in the book. Were there any major challenges when writing this? Obviously, you've got the reading and the research and the sheer weight of the, the word count and all of those things that authors will, will face. But was there anything in particular with this, with this subject that you found challenging? Yes, definitely. I mean, one of the, one of the things is that there were so many of the medics and trying to keep tabs on whom I'd already written a mini chapter about on the way through. And then I'd go on to a different, perhaps I'd, perhaps I'd talked about this person when, when they'd been a suspect. 
And and then I would be doing Harley Street and I'm thinking, oh dear, now I need to do them for Harley Street as well. And I had to work all that out, that sort of stuff out. And it did drive me nuts for a bit, but I sorted it in the end. You've got to try and recognise the fact that medicine changes down the years. And so I had to have something that was in date order and the major chapters are all in date order. But then I get to the end and there are some doctors who have such short pieces to say or do within a book where they feature that you can't really write a chapter in bank, but you have to keep them there. So you have to have what any really bad secretary has in, in, in her filing system, which is miscellaneous. You should never do it, of course, because you lose it all then. But I, I called it extras, just so, and, and those are actually in alphabetical order. It was murder, mind you. It really was murder sometimes. There's so many of them. After all this research, is there one of them that you think we should all really look out for, that maybe you found something out about them that you didn't know before and you think other people may find that interesting? There's one that I've discovered only in the last week that, that only gets mentioned at the very end of one of her books and none of the people who've done A to Z or all those other books have ever mentioned that one. Mm. They've missed it out completely. Well, that's quite an interesting one for everybody to try and guess which one that is as well. And we'll be back with Ray for part two of her interview slightly later in the show. Back to our story, Cards on the Table. Mr Shaitana has gathered a lethal combination of murderers, victims and detectives to his dinner party and bridge night. As the guests settle down to play a few hands, Mr Shaitana sits out the games instead opting for a solitary place near the fire. When the fun and games are over, Shaitana is discovered to have been murdered with a thin dagger called a stiletto. But who has committed this crime? Wyro believes the answers lie in the cards and begins to examine the guests' bridge scores. His analysis provides us, dear listeners, with the following clues. Dr Roberts, a bluffer, an overbidder of his hand, a man with complete confidence in his own powers to pull off a risky thing. Anne Meredith, quite a safe player. She doesn't make mistakes, but she isn't brilliant. Major Despard, a good player too, what you might call a long-headed chap. Mrs Lorimer, a damned good player. She's got an amount of nerve as well, and she is the sort of woman who may have a secret in her life. But is it possible to know about somebody's personality from a game of bridge? And how else does this card game help to reveal the murderer? We now speak to coach of the mixed Swedish bridge team, Laura Coville. For those people who may not have heard of bridge before, let's start with the very, very basics. What is bridge? So bridge is a card game. It's played by four people. And I'll keep the description of the rules a little bit simple because we like to say it's, you know, an hour to learn and a lifetime to get better. Uh, But it is a trick-taking game. So there will first be an auction where you determine how many tricks your side needs to get and with which suit is trumps or then might be no trump suit at all. And then you have to try and fulfill that contract by taking between zero and 13 tricks. 13 is the number obtained by this 52 cards in a deck of cards. And if you divide that by the four people, it's 13. It does sound to me when I've seen bits of it or sort of read, like in the book that we're looking at the moment, Cards on the Table, I can hear the language of bidding and things like that. Is it a bit of a gambling game? It definitely was at the time that they were playing it. So they're playing Rubber Bridge and they are playing for money. I looked up, I, so I love this book, so I, I looked up how much money Mrs. Oliver loses at the beginning and she's lost more than £300 uh, in today's money. So they are gambling, they're gambling for a lot. These days we have structured our tournaments and games a little bit differently so there's much less of a gambling element involved and we've also structured the tournaments to try and actually remove 
some of the elements of luck of who holds the best hands. If, uh, the landscape of bridge is pretty different now than it was in 1937. Is it, obviously we're talking there, it's a card game. So card games themselves seem pretty cheap. You just need a pack of cards. But as I was doing a bit of research on bridge, there did seem to be some other equipment and things that you might need is is that true or is it mainly the cards i mean so absolutely you can play just with a deck of cards and four people that is how the game started and you can still do that today but if you were to go and play in a club or at a tournament then probably you would be confronted by some slightly strange looking equipment you might be given a bidding box which holds the range of bids available to you uh, which you can make if you are playing at a really high level, you might even have a screen involved. And this screen goes between you and your partner so that it minimizes the amount of inference you're allowed to make by looking at your partner's facial expression and their body language to remove those cues and also to reduce the amount of cheating, unfortunately. So there was quite a, a culture of cheating that's kind of had to be stamped out. Yes. Uh, the first big case was a British pair, Reese and Shapiro, uh, who were cheating in the World Championships by holding up the number of fingers as the number of hearts that they had uh, in their hand. There was uh, subsequently, it has been alleged and not proved that the Italian blue team in the 1980s were cheating in a number of different ways. And then recently, we're now in, in the information era. So now that there is bridge available to play online, People can cheat in online bridge games in much the same way as they could cheat in an online chess game, which has also been pretty common. And during the pandemic, when so many more people were playing online more than ever before, there was some cheating, unfortunately, happening, which had to be addressed. So we've seen enormous leaps forward in AI being able to now beat humans at chess, at Go, uh, at other games. Actually, this is not yet the case in bridge, and it's partly because of this hidden information. In chess, you can literally just calculate every possible move. And in bridge, it's not quite like that because you can only see your hand. You can't see the hand held by the other three people. And those cards can be arranged in a different number of ways. So that is one aspect of why computers are not that good at bridge. A second aspect is uh, because you are communicating in set ways with your partner, you have to explain to the opponents a little bit of the agreements that you have on what you're doing. And computers are really bad at explaining that in a legal way. So that it's sometimes it's the case that they can play perfectly well, but they're disobeying the laws of bridge by not explaining what they're doing perfectly to their opponents. What do you think would get more people involved with bridge? This is a really good question. And I guess that answering it also depends a little bit on what kind of bridge you want to promote. Uh, I So I grew up playing bridge and I love the community aspect of the game and I do think it would be a pity to lose that social aspect which is the reason that they loved playing it so much uh, in the 1930s in the age of, that, of Agatha Christie it was absolutely the thing that you did after dinner uh, in order to still be socialising with everyone there in a kind of structured way which was conforming to uh, sort of social cues that they could easily read so I would love to see more build up in schools and in communities to get more people playing realistically actually the easiest way to get lots of people playing probably would be if you had a really uh, good and addictive app but I, I do think it would be a pity to to lose the social aspect so mrs Lorimer in the book she describes herself as a bridge fiend and she's she's thrilled to to hear this is not just a dinner party it's not just going to be drinks there's going to be bridge after. It's almost like all the things that came before is not important now because bridge is there. And she's obviously someone who's very passionate about the game, very dedicated to the game. Is it something that can become very addictive? Absolutely. And people make careers out of bridge. I, I have also found it very addictive myself. I do have a career which is not in bridge, but many people find that it is so addictive that actually all that they do uh, is play bridge. If they are at work, they're playing bridge. And if they're on their leisure time, they're also playing bridge. I think the puzzle part is a huge uh, aspect. So there are you're never going to play the same hand of bridge twice, essentially. The cards are going to be in a different confirmation every time. So you can play as much as you like and never face the same problem again, uh, or not in the exact same variant. And that's just hugely exciting. 
Yes. Does it get overly competitive? It gets incredibly competitive. Actually, I think that the worst rows I've seen have been between partners. And this is, I, I don't want to stereotype too much, but you can have really horrible rows break out at the table when somebody has misinterpreted the bid of their partner or they've played something just really, really poorly. But also the tradition that maybe it's not a good idea to play with your life partner because you don't want to be taking that argument home with you at the end of the night. Well, that's actually what happens in the book, isn't it? It's kind of random how they are, they're, they're paired up. Um, I think Mr. Shaitana has a plan there, but he, you know, they split off into their into their pairs. And then is it the case that you swap partners as the game develops? So you almost like play a round and then you can swap and you play another round and you can swap or do people tend to keep the same partner? So they're playing a variant of the game, which is not as common anymore, called Rubber Bridge which is a really strictly defined set of hands. Uh, you want to keep playing until one of the pairs has made two games. And after that, the rubber is finished and you can switch to a new partner. And Dr. Roberts says uh, that they'd been cutting for partners. So that means that they've been using the deck of cards to determine who would be partners in each rubber. Probably the two higher cards which are drawn are, the, are partners and the two lower cards are also partners. And now, in a change to your scheduled broadcast, a public service announcement about the dangers of playing bridge. Did you know that bridge, the beloved card game of strategy and wit, has been known to cause quite a stir in some circles? In the 1950s, bridge tournaments were about more than just friendly competition. They were also a battleground for international espionage. That's right. At the height of the Cold War, cunning spies disguised as innocent bridge enthusiasts used these tournaments as cover for exchanging top-secret information. Imagine, under the guise of a simple card game, spies from rival nations engaged in a high-stakes cat-and-mouse game with the fate of nations hanging in the balance. So next time you gather around the bridge table, remember that behind the innocent facade lies a rich history of intrigue that would make even James Bond raise an eyebrow. We return now to our interview with Ray Green, and we rejoin the conversation as I ask her why in Chapter 3, entitled Murderers, she breaks with whodunit tradition and reveals the name of the killers up front. Because I felt that I, I've read an awful lot of who've done it books, like Dorothy Sayer and, and Clinton Doyle and, and Edmund Crispin and, and uh, 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 loads and loads of them. And all those books and all those authors from their work um, analysed and parsed all the time. And nobody takes any exception to them discussing the merger. Not at all. And I thought, no, it's now been over a hundred years that this has been going on. And I've never been very good at doing as I'm told. And in fact, I'm very weak, I think, in that area of life. I tend to I was brought up by a father who who said, Don't do as people tell you, dear. Think it out for yourself. I think the time has come and I may create mayhem, but I am doing a chapter on Agatha Christie's doctors who are majors. Did you feel a pressure to make sure you hadn't missed a single medical professional mentioned in Agatha Christie's works? I'm quite sure that there will be people who will say, but you haven't done this and you haven't done that and you haven't done the other. I've tried to make it clear at the beginning that I have only worked on full-length novels, not short stories. I have done a, a, a chapter at the beginning about doctors in Agatha Christie's own life just to, you know, because I felt that needed to be there. And she, she's one of the things that she says is that when she first um, went to work in a hospital as a, as a young woman, shortly before she married Archie, she was shocked to find that the doctors were held in, in such high regard because the society that she'd moved in, in, in Torquay, her family would have been on, on a par with the sort of doctors and vendors and people like that, not, not real high ups, but people respected in the community. 
And, and she expected the doctors to treat her as an equal because of this and found that this was not going down very well. <laughs> and she loved it. She thought it was very funny. As many people will know, during the First World War in 1917, Agatha Christie worked as a dispenser at the Red Cross Hospital in Torquay. Have you managed to mention the pharmacies at all? Um, then there's quite a lot of trouble in pharmacies throughout the thing. It makes you very concerned. <laughs> and of course, there's, there's one chemist who's a, who's a really nasty person doing very nasty things very deliberately. The book flits between fiction and non-fiction, but in the last chapter, you've written some of the characters into a story of your own. Is that right? Purely fiction. Just I just brought some. I just didn't want to stop and just say thank you. That's it at the end. So I I did a, a chapter which um, God, yeah. Don't ever try and write fiction. It's so much harder. Yeah, I I had three or four sleepless nights over it, and it was only going to be a short, a, a short sort of chatter. And I thought, well, this is not easy. A dozen doctors and medics into a room having having conversations. Our journey takes us back to Sweden where Laura Coville, the national coach of the mixed bridge team, has been unravelling the intricacies of the game. Now we delve into the eerie connections between bridge and the chilling murder in Agatha Christie's Cards on the Table, a tale disturbingly similar to a real-life crime, as Laura will explain. We also explore the high-stakes world of international tournaments, where players risk facing decade-long bans and how Agatha Christie left plenty of clues for seasoned bridge players to help them solve the murder. In the book, when the murder occurs, Pyro, one of the things that he sort of jumps to straight away is, is looking at the bridge scores. And you know, this is questioned, like, what are, you, what are you doing, man, kind of thing? Why are you looking at these bridge scores? That's ridiculous. We should be getting on with solving the murder. And Poirot makes it very clear, well, actually, I can tell a lot from this, um, from how this has been scored and how this person has chosen to play a game. I can tell a lot about their personality. Would you say that's true or would you say that's just something that's perhaps been used as a, a quirky, like, oh, let's solve the murder through bridge? Or is that something that you would actually see? I actually think it's quite true. I think that it holds a lot of uh, a lot of maybe genuine observation by Agatha Christie, who was herself a bridge player, uh, that if you are a more timid person, generally you're probably also going to be timid at bridge. If you are uh, a bit self-aggrandizing, like some of the other players in the book, that's also going to reflect itself in your bridge. I'm not sure that I'd be able to sell, solve a murder based on it. But there were particular aspects which really stood out, and particularly because they were playing for money, maybe. Uh, actually, there's uh, there's aspects there that come into really sharp relief. The fact that the murderer has left the table during the most exciting hand of the evening to a bridge player is really, really weird. That he's bid a Grand Slam, it's been doubled, and then he's not stayed to watch. You can tell immediately that something is wrong there. So, so much of the play really rings true. And I think that there's been some effort put into making sure that uh, there's consistency and accuracy in the bridge as well. For a bridge player reading that book, there are hidden clues that Agatha Christie's put in there that perhaps only bridge players would pick up on. Pretty much, but that does happen. People do stand up when they are the dummy and they will go and stretch their legs or get a drink or do anything, but not during a Grand Slam. <laughs> That's so weird. So a Grand Slam is where they have committed to trying to win all 13 tricks. They cannot lose a single trick. And then it's been doubled. We're up to double points. And we've seen how much money they were playing for in the other room. They're probably playing for similar amounts in this room. So it's not only that this is exciting sort of in a more abstract sense. There's a lot of money riding on this hand. 
when you go to these international tournaments and these big, big competitions, the thing for me in picturing it is that obviously there's four of you. It's quite intimate in that way that it's it's everything is happening in this small space here between four people. But obviously, because it is a tournament, there has to be a large scale to it. So are people literally playing table, 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 table next to each other? And is there a referee or somebody that goes around sort of monitoring and making sure that the rules are being adhered to? Absolutely. So, so the bigger tournaments are likely to have maybe 300 tables, like a set of four people, and you need to rent a pretty big sports hall in order to facilitate that. You'll also have hired a number of directors, and the director is the person who will go around. Usually, uh, because there's four of you, someone will notice if there is a problem, if a rule has not been adhered to, and then you call for the director and their attention is directed to you. Usually, it's honest mistakes that somebody has led when it wasn't their turn to lead, or they have made a bid which wasn't high enough, which is against the rules. And this just needs to be corrected in a way which minimizes the damage to the board as much as possible, uh, the damage to the play as much as possible. Uh, but yes, it is also the case that some people are indulging in unethical behavior and doing it on purpose. It is quite a challenging thing for a director to out and out accuse somebody of cheating. Uh, this is a huge accusation and it can result in very long bans. It is possible to get a ban of 10 or more years from playing bridge with your respective federation. So these are allegations which you want to be careful about making and accumulate evidence over actually quite a large number of boards if you think that somebody is making the same sorts of efforts consistently. You were talking to me a little bit before about how um, bridge is a very exciting game and sometimes this can lead to tensions between people and arguments and I think your advice was one of the um, people you probably don't want to play bridge with is your life partner and I believe you have got a bit of a story where that is taken to the absolute extreme and uh, something quite bad happens. Absolutely. So uh, there is a case where a friendly game of kitchen bridge actually resulted in a murder, and this happened in 1929. And the so there's two parts of this case, because there's what actually happened, and then there's the sensationalised bridge mythology which has grown up around it because we, we we love a bit of drama. So the bare bones of the case, I believe, were actually that a woman called Myrtle Bennett, who was in her mid-30s, was playing bridge with her husband and they were playing against two of their neighbours. And it seems to be consensus that her husband, John, was playing a four spade contract, which is a gamed contract, and he played it really, really badly and he went down. And Myrtle was so frustrated by his uh, poor play that she called him a bumbridge player. And he essentially assaulted her for saying this. And then she went and got a gun and shot him. And he died. And the more remarkable facets of this case are, first of all, that she was acquitted. Uh, and I like the quote of the prosecution assistant who said, it looks like an open season on husbands. But then at this point, we also have the enter Eli Culbertson. Eli Culbertson was a professional bridge player in the 1920s. Uh, he was an American and he was, uh, they call him the P.T. Barnum of bridge. He really popularized bridge in America. And he sort of saw all of the sort of potential of this case to hook the public and the media on bridge rather than uh, on the details of the murder, which were maybe more uh, explanatory, such as the domestic abuse. Uh, so instead, he sort of popularized the myth that uh so for example that the play of this four spade contract had been presented to the jury as evidence and that this was why Myrtle had got off that the jury agreed that his play was so poor that he deserved to be killed and there was also a great deal of speculation about what the hand might have been and if he had bid it differently or played it differently might he still be alive and still uh, almost a hundred years later, bridge players still tell that story as as a cautionary tale about being nice to one's partner and playing with one's uh, spouse. 
bridge is obviously very popular and has featured in several books and films and it's the star of a james bond book too isn't it yeah so in the book this is moonraker the baddie is a big gambler and he gambles on bridge and james bond and m have to sort of go undercover and uh, manipulate the cards in such a way that this guy is going to be so hoodwinked into betting a large amount of money again on a grand slam we love grand slams they're so dramatic actually they have manipulated the cards and they've substituted in a dummy deck so that james bond is going to make his grand slam uh, even though the bidding was completely ridiculous he has overbid his hand in a robertsian way uh, but he makes the contract and they win a lot of money Well, thank you very much for that, Laura. That has certainly given me something to think about, especially if I ever want to play bridge with my partner. If people want to learn more about bridge or get in contact with uh, yourself or a bridge club or an organisation, what's the best way for them to go about that? So if you are in the UK, then you can go to the English Bridge Union website and find out uh, who your local club is and where they meet and when. Uh, If you're interested in playing online, then you can uh, go to BridgeBase Online, which is the largest website where you can get a pickup game really quickly. And I'm also going to plug, I'm part of the Qubids team. And Qubids is an app which allows you to practice bidding uh, with your partner, but you don't have to be in the room with them. So maybe it's a safer option. And this is uh, available for iPhone and Android. As I'm currently coach of the Swedish Mixed Bridge team, Uh, And you can follow our progress at the European Championships in June. And I, for one, will certainly be uh, cheering on Sweden, even though I'm English, just because you're such a fantastic coach and someone who's introduced me to this, this very dangerous and thrilling game. Well, friends, we've almost scored 100 or more trick points below the line for this episode, but we have one more card up our sleeve as we return to author Ray Green, who explains her motivation behind her Agatha Christie fanzine and her wider works to preserve local history. You co-edit an Agatha Christie fanzine called Agatha Christie, The Legacy. Who did you do that project with? My son, Nick Smart, who also co-edits David Bowie Glamour with my brother. (laughs) He and my brother do that. They've been doing that one for years and he said to me one day, could we do an Agatha Christie one? And I said, oh, that would be fun, let's. So we did. And it came out on the first day of the first lockdown, which was very interesting. Your future projects may contain a few more books, possibly Agatha Christie's Victims and Agatha Christie's Murderers. What can you tell us about that? Well, it keeps changing because I thought it would be a good idea to do the victims first. And now my son, Nick, takes an interest in this. He's saying, I think you ought to do the murderers first. And I'm thinking, I disagree. I think I, I think I ought to do the victims first. I don't want you to. Hmm. I mean, how do people become the victims of murder, you see? I've been doing a lot of work on that, and it's very interesting. I don't want to say too much yet. <laughs> Away from Agatha Christie, you're actively involved with preserving the local history of where you live in Whirl in Somerset. Can you tell us about some of the work that you do as part of that project? Right. Well, the first thing is that I came to live in Whirl High Street when I was three. Um, so I, I had I grew up with them, all, all my grandparents around me and aunts and uncles and, and all the rest of it. So it was lovely, really. And I was the only child, so I was spoiled rotten. So that was great. I loved the village, always loved it. My mother once said to me when I was about nine years old, I was wondering what we'd think about it if we thought we might move to Hutton. Hutton is another village about three or four miles away, and she was teaching there at the time. And I said, Hutton? I'm not going to Hutton? And she said, well, why not? I said, because it's not well. And I was, I just loved the place. And you see, it was the high street that we moved into. And compared with Welsh Valleys, which I loved as well, because I went back visiting them all the time, loved that as well. But it was completely different because Well High Street, to me, as a little tiny one, was like Las Vegas. We had street lights and all sorts of wonderful things, lit windows in the shops and things like that. It's lovely. 
Um, so I've lived here more or less all my life, um, but only very short breaks. So I've been here all my life. I know an awful lot about the village and I know all people in the village. And when I retired, I thought, oh, well, now what am I going to do now then? So after a few years, I, I kept on doing the archaeology club that I'd started at the college. And then my knees started objecting to that. Knees are terrible things when they start getting to be a nuisance. Yes, we've got to be careful. Um, and so we closed down the archaeology club. And I said to a friend of mine who'd been doing it with me, Frank Costi, and his wife, Jenny, who I'd known since I was three and she was four. Um, I, I, I said, I, don't, I think the only thing we can do, Frank, is, is to do a history society instead, because that would be all right for our knees. So we did. And we started it in their dining room. I, had a, put, I put one photograph in the local paper of um, the Methodist Chapel Youth Club in the 1960s and was inundated with people wanting copies of it and this, that and the other. And we had, we said, well, we'd have to have a meeting or something. So we had a, we had a meeting in what used to be the Methodist Chapel and, and it was full and, and people insisted and said, how often can we have these meetings then? And what are we going to do? And so we just did it because they told us to, essentially. And it's been running ever since. We meet every month on the first Thursday at seven o'clock in the Methodist Chapel. And we've always got about between 80 and 100 members. And, with. and I said, I thought it'd be a good idea if we did a snapshot year. We chose one year that we could all look into and find out about. It. Um, and, and we could make it our snapshot year. And, and I said, I think we ought to do 1953 because it was coronation year. And we all remembered it as a consequence, because <laughs> it was a bit unusual. And, and so I just started researching in 1953, and, and, um, and I loved it. It was, it was so, yeah, really good. And so I, I wrote the book, um, and I took it to a no-court printer, and they printed it for me, and I only had 50 copies done, and they, and they we just sold them. And now it's free to download on the website, worldhistorysociety.net slash publications. And all the books are on there. As part of her work for the Society, Ray has written books on Whirl in the First and Second World Wars and also a book about the local football club, which, as Ray has said, she's very glad play in the colour of her own name, Green. Links to all of Ray's works can be found on our website at abitpod.my. Dot canva dot site. And of course we will update our social media pages and website when Ray's book hits the shops and don't forget to watch out for the Swedish mixed bridge team in this summer's tournaments. We'd love it if you'd join in the conversation on our social media handles at a bit of a Christy. You can check us out on Instagram, X and even Facebook. If you could like, subscribe or leave a review to support the podcast and stay updated on all things A Bit of a Christie, that would be fantastic. Your engagement helps us to grow and bring you more intriguing content. I've been Hazel Jones and this has been A Bit of a Christie.